The Fellowship of the Ring, Chapter 1, A Long-Expected Party When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 11th birthday with the party of special magnificence, there was much talk and excitement in Hobbiton. Bilbo was very rich and very peculiar, and had been the wonder of the Shire for 60 years ever since his remarkable disappearance and unexpected return. The riches he had brought back from his travels had now become a local legend, and it was popularly believed, whatever the old folk might say, that the hill at Bag End was full of tunnels stuffed with treasure. And if that was not enough for fame, there was also his prolonged vigor to marvel in it. Time wore on, but it seemed to have little effect on Mr. Baggins. At 90, he was much the same as 50. At 99, they began to call him well-preserved, but unchanged would have been nearer the mark. There were some that shook their heads and thought that this was too much of a good thing. It seemed unfair that anyone should possess, apparently, perpetual youth as well as, reputedly, inexhaustible wealth. It will have to be paid for, they said. It isn't, it isn't natural, and trouble will come of it. But so far, trouble had not come, and as Mr. Baggins was generous with his money, most people were willing to forgive him his oddities and his good fortune. He remained on visiting terms with his relatives, except, of course, the Sackville Bagginses, and he had many devoted admirers among the hobbits of poor and unimportant families. But he had no close friends until some of his younger cousins began to grow up. The eldest of these, and Bilbo's favorite, was young Frodo Baggins. When Bilbo was 99, he adopted, Frogan, uh, he adopted Frodo as his heir and brought him to live at Bag End. And the hopes of the Sackville Bagginses were finally dashed. Bilbo and Frodo happened to have the same birthday, September 22nd. You had better come and live here, Frodo, my lad, said Bilbo one day, and then we can celebrate our birthday parties comfortably together. At that time, Frodo was still in his tweens, as the hobbits called the irresponsible twenties, between childhood and coming of age at 33. Twelve more years passed. Each year, the Bagginses had given very lively combined birthday parties at Bag End, but now it was understood that something quite exceptional was being planned for that autumn. Bilbo was to be 11 to 1, 111, a rather curious number, and a very respectable age for a hobbit. The old Took himself had only reached 130. And Frodo was going to be 33, 33, an important number, the date of his coming of age. Tongues began to wag in Hobbiton and Bywater, and rumor of the coming event traveled all over the Shire. The history and character of, Bi of Mr. Bilbo Baggins became once again the chief topic of conversation, and the older folks suddenly found their, remin their reminiscences in welcome demand. No one had a more attentive audience than old Ham Gamgee, commonly known as the Gaffer. He held forth at the Ivy Bush, a small inn on the Bywater Road, and he spoke with some authority, for he had tended the garden at Bag End for 40 years, and had helped old Holman in the same job before that. Now, that he was himself growing old and stiff in the joints, the job was mainly carried on by his youngest son, Sam Gamgee. Both father and son were on very friendly terms with Bilbo and Frodo. They lived on the hill itself, in number three Bagsh Bagshot Row, just below Bag End. A very nice, well-spoken, gentle hobbit is Mr. Bilbo, as I've always said, the gaffer declared. With perfect truth, for Bilbo was very polite to him, calling him Master Hamfast, 
and consulting him constantly upon the growing of vegetables in the matter of roots, especially potatoes, the gaffer was recognized as the leading authority by all in the neighborhood, including himself. But what, but what about this Frodo that lives with him? Asked Old Noakes of Bywater. Baggins is his name, but he's more than a half a brandy buck, they say. It beats me why any Baggins of Hobbiton should go looking for a wife away there in Buckland, where folks are so queer. And no wonder they're queer, put in Daddy Twofoot, the gaffer's next door neighbor. If they live on the wrong side of the Brandywine River and right again, and right again the old forest, that's a dark, bad place. If half the tales be true. You're right, Dan, said the gaffer. Not that the Brady Bucks of Buckland live in the old forest, but they're a queer breed, seemingly. They fool about with boats on that big river, and that isn't natural. Small wonder that trouble came of it, I say. But be that it may, Mr. Frodo is as nice a young hobbit as you could wish to meet. Very much like Mr. Bilbo, and in more than looks. After all, his father was a Baggins. A decent, respectable hobbit was Mr. Drogo Baggins. There was never much of him of, or, sorry, there was never much to tell of him until he was drowned. Drowned? said several voices. They had heard this and other darker rumors before, of course, but hobbits have a passion for family history, and they were ready to hear it again. Well, so they say, said the gaffer. You see, Mr. Drogo, he, par he married poor Miss Primula Brandybuck. She was our Mr. Bilbo's first cousin on the mother's side, her mother being the youngest of the old Took's daughters, and Mr. Drogo was his second cousin. So, Mr. Frodo is his first and second cousin, once removed, either way, as the saying is, if you follow me. And Mr. Drogo was staying at Brandy Hall with his father-in-law, Old Master Gordobat, or Gorbadoc, as he often did after his marriage. Him being partial to his vittles and Old Gorbadoc keeping a mighty generous table. And he went out boating on the Brandywine River, and he and his wife were drowned, and poor Mr. Frodo, only a child and all. I've heard they went on the water after dinner in the moonlight, said Old Noakes, <clears throat> and it was Drogo's weight as sunk the boat. And I heard she pushed him in, and he pulled her in after him, said Sandy Man the Hobbiton Miller. You shouldn't listen to all you hear, Sandy Man, said the gaffer, who did not much like the Miller. There isn't no call to go talking of pushing and pulling. Boats are quite tricky enough for those that sit still without looking further for a cause of trouble. Anyway, there was this Mr. Frodo left an orphan and stranded, as you might say, among those queer Bucklanders being brought up anyhow in Brandy Hall. A regular warn by all accounts. Old Master Gorbadoc never had fewer than a couple of hundred relations in that place. Mr. Bilbo never did a kinder deed than when he brought the lad back to live among decent folk. But I reckon it was a nasty shock for those Sackville Bagginses. They thought they were going to get Bag End. That time when he went off and was thought to be dead. And then he comes back and orders them off, and he goes on living and living, and never a day older, bless him. And suddenly he produces an heir, and has all the papers made out proper. The Sackville Bagginses won't never see the inside of Bag End now, or it is to be hoped not. There is a tidy bit of money tucked away up there, I hear tell, said a stranger a visitor on business from Michelle Delving in the West Farthing. All the top of your hill is full of tunnels packed with chests of gold and silver and jewels. But what I've heard. 
Then you've heard more than I can speak to, said the gaffer. I know nothing about jewels. Mr. Bilbo is free with his money, and there seems no lack of it, but I know of no tunnel making. I saw Mr. Bilbo when he came back, a matter of sixty years ago, when I was a lad. <coughs> I not long come pretense, or sorry, I not long come prentice to old Holman, him being my dad's cousin, but he had me up at Bag End helping him to keep folks from trampling and trespassing all over the garden while the sale was on. And in the middle of it all, Mr. Bilbo comes up the hill with a pony and some mighty big bags and a couple of chests. I don't doubt they were mostly full of treasure he had picked up in foreign parts, where there be mountains of gold, they say, but there wasn't enough to fill tunnels. But my lad Sam will know more about that. He's in and out of Bag End. Crazy about stories of the old days, he is, and he listens to all Mr. Bilbo's tales. Mr. Bilbo has learned him his letters, meaning no harm, mark you, and I hope no harm will come of it. Elves and dragons, I say to him. Cabbages and potatoes are better for me and you. Don't be getting mixed up in the business of your betters, or your land in trouble, or you land in trouble too big for you. I says to him, and I might say it to others. He added with a look at the stranger in the mill. In the miller, sorry. But the gaffer did not convince his audience. The legend of Bilbo's wealth was now too firmly mixed or fixed in the minds of the younger generation of hobbits. Uh, but he has likely enough been adding to what he brought at first, argued the miller, voicing common opinion. He's often away from home, and look at the outlandish folk that visit him, dwarves coming at night, and the old wandering conjurer Gandalf and all. You can say that, you can say what you like, Gaffer, but Bag End's a queer place, and its folk are queerer. And you can say what you like about what you know more, or what you know no more of than you do of voting, Mr. Sandyman retorted the gaffer, disliking the miller even more than usual. If that's being queer, then we could do with a bit more queerness in these parts. There's some not far away that wouldn't offer a pint of beer to a friend if they lived in a hole with golden walls. But they do things proper at Bag End. Our Sam says that everyone's going to be invited to the party, and there's going to be presents, mark you, presents for all, this very month as is. <clears throat> that very month was September, and as fine as you could ask. A day or two later, a rumor, probably started by the knowledgeable Sam, was spread about that there was going to be fireworks. Fireworks? What is more, such as had not been seen in the Shire for nigh a century, not indeed since the old Took died. <clears throat> Days passed, and the day drew nearer. An odd-looking wagon laden with odd-looking packages rolled into Hobbiton one evening and toiled up the hill to Bag End. The startled hobbits peered out of lamp-lit doors to gape at it. It was driven by outlandish folk, singing strange songs. Excuse me. Drawers with long beards and deep hoods. A few of them remained at Bag End. At the end of the second week in September, a cart came in through Bywater from the direction of the Brandywine Bridge in broad daylight. An old man was driving it all alone. He wore a tall pointed blue hat, a long gray cloak, and a silver scarf. He had a long white beard and bushy eyebrows that stuck out behind the brim of his hat. Small hobbit children ran after the cart all through Hobbiton and ride up the hill. <coughs> it had a cargo of fireworks, as they rightly guessed. At Bilbo's front door, the old man began to unload. There were great bundles of fireworks on all sorts and shapes, each labeled with a large red G and the elf rune. I don't know what it is. Uh, 
That was Gandalf's mark, of course, and the old man was Gandalf the wizard, whose fame in the Shire was due mainly to his skill with fires, smokes, and lights. His real business was far more difficult and dangerous, but the Shire folk knew nothing about it. To them, he was just one of those attractions at the party. Hence the excitement of the Hobbit children. Gee for grand, they shouted, and the old man smiled. They knew him by sight, though he only appeared in Hobbiton occasionally and never stopped long, but neither they nor any but the oldest of their elders had seen one of his fireworks displays. They now belonged to the legendary past. When the old man helped, oh, when the old man, helped by Bilbo and some dwarves, had finished unloading, Bilbo gave a few pennies away, but not a single squib or cracker was forthcoming to the disappointed, uh, disappointment of the onlookers. Run away now, said Gandalf. You'll get plenty when the time comes. Then he disappeared inside with Bilbo, and the door was shut. The young hobbits stared at the, at the door in vain for a while, and then made off, feeling that the day of the party would never come. Inside Bag End, Bilbo and Gandalf were sitting at the open window of a small room looking out west onto the garden. The late afternoon was bright and peaceful. The flowers glowed red and golden, snapdragons and sunflowers, and nasturtiums trailing all over the turf walls and peeping in at the round windows. How bright your garden looks, said Gandalf. Yes, said Bilbo. I'm very fond of it, indeed, and of all the dear old Shire, but I think I need a holiday. You mean to go on with your plan, then? I do. I made up my mind months ago, and I haven't changed it. Oh, very well. It is no good saying any more. Stick to your plan, your whole plan, mind, and I hope it will turn out for the best for you and for all of us. I hope so. Anyway, I mean to enjoy myself on Thursday and have my little joke. Uh, who will laugh, I wonder, said Gandalf, shaking his head. Uh, we, should so we shall see, said Bilbo. The next day, more carts rolled up the hill, and still more carts. There might have been more, some grumbling about dealing locally, but that very week, orders began to pour out of Bag End for every kind of provision, commodity, or luxury that could be obtained in Hobbiton, or Bywater, or anywhere in the neighborhood. <coughs> People became enthusiastic, and they began to tick off the days on the calendar, and they watched eagerly for the postman, hoping for invitations. Before long, the invitations began pouring out, and the Hobbiton post office was blocked and the Bywater post office was snowed under, and voluntary assistant postmen were called for. There was a constant stream of them going up the hill, carrying hundreds of polite variations on, thank you, I shall certainly come. A notice appeared on the gate at Bag End. No admittance except on party business. Even those who had or pretended to have party business were seldom allowed inside. Bilbo was busy, writing invitations, ticking off answers, packing up presents, and making some private preparations of his own. From the time of Gandalf's arrival, he remained hidden from view. One morning, the hobbits woke to find the large field south of Bilbo's front door, covered with ropes and pools for tents and pavilions. A special strain, or sorry, a special entrance was cut into the bank leading to the road, and wide steps and a large white gate were built there. The three hobbit families of Bagshot Row, adjoining the field, were intensely interested and generally envied. Old Gaffer Gamgee stopped. Uh, old Gaffer Gamgee stopped even pretending to work in his garden. The tents began to go up. There was a specially large pavilion, so big that the tree that grew in the field was right inside it, and stood proudly near one end, at the head of the chief table. Lanterns were hung on all its branches. More promising still, to the hobbit's mind, 
An enormous open-air kitchen was erected in the north corner of the field. A draught of cooks from every inn and eating house for miles around arrived to supplement the dwarves and other odd folk that were quartered at Bag End. Excitement rose to its height. Then the weather clouded over. That was on Wednesday, the eve of the party. Anxiety was intense. Then Thursday, September the 22nd, actually dawned. The sun got up, the clouds vanished, flags were unfurled, and the fun began. Bill O'Baggins called it a party, but it was really a variety of entertainments rolled into one. Practically everybody living near was invited. A very few were overlooked by accident, but as they turned up all the same, that did not matter. Many people from other parts of the Shire were also asked, and there were even a few from outside the borders. Bilbo met the guests and additions at the new White Gate in person. He gave away presents to all and sundry. The later were those, or the latter were those who went out again by a, a back way and came in again by the gate. Hobbits give presents to other people on their own birthdays. Not very expensive ones, as a rule, and not so lavishly as on this occasion, but it was not a bad system. Actually, Hobbiton and Bywater, every day in the year, it was somebody's birthday, so that every Hobbit in those parts had a fair chance of at least one present at least once a week. But they never got tired of them. On this occasion, the presents were unusually good. The Hobbit children were so excited that for a while they almost forgot about eating. They were toys, or there were toys the like of which they had never seen before, all beautiful and some obviously magical. Many of them had indeed been ordered a year before and had come all the way from the mountain and from Dale and were of real dwarf making. When every guest had become or had been welcomed and was finally inside the gate, there were songs, dances, music, games, and of course, food and drink. There were three official meals, lunch, tea, and dinner, or supper. But lunch and tea were marked chiefly by the fact that at those times all the guests were sitting down and eating together. At other times there were merely lots of there were merely lots of people eating and drinking, continuously from elevenses until six thirty, when the fireworks started. The fireworks were by Gandalf, and they were not only brought by him, but designed and made by him, and the special effects set pieces and flights of rockets were led off by him. But there, were, there was also a generous distribution of squibs, crackers, back wrappers, sparklers, torches, dwarf candles, elf fountains, goblin barkers, and thunderclaps. They were all superb. The art of Gandalf improved with age. There were rockets like a flight of scintillating birds singing with sweet voices. There were green trees with trunks of dark smoke. Their leaves opened like a whole spring unfolding in a moment, and their shining branches dropped glowing flowers down upon the astonished hobbits, disappearing with a sweet scent just before they touched their upturned faces. There were fountains of butterflies that flew glittering into the trees. There were pillars of colored fires that rose and turned into eagles or sailing ships, or a phalanx of, sw of flying swans. There was a th red thunderstorm and a shower of yellow rain. There was a forest of silver spears that sprang suddenly into the air with a yell like an embattled army and came down again into the water with a hiss like a hundred hot snakes. And there was also one last surprise in honor of Bilbo, and it startled the hobbits exceedingly as Gandalf intended. The lights went out. A great smoke went up. It shaped itself like a mountain seen in the distance and began to glow at the summit. It spouted green and scarlet flames. Out flew a red golden dragon. Not life-size, but terribly lifelike. Fire came from its jaws. His eyes glared down, and there was a roar, and he whizzed three times over the heads of the crowd. They all ducked, and many fell flat on their faces. The dragon passed like an express train, turned 
a somersault and burst over Bywater with a deafening explosion. That is the signal for supper, said Bilbo. The pain and alarm vanished at once, and the prostrate hobbits leaped to their feet. There was a splendid supper for everyone. For everyone, that is, except those invited to the special family dinner party. This was held in the great pavilion with the tree. The invitations were limited to twelve dozen, a number also called by the hobbits one gross, though the word was not considered proper to use of people. And the guests were selected from all the families to which Bilbo and Frodo were related, with the addition of a few special unrelated friends, such as Gandalf. Many young hobbits were included, and present by parental permission, for hobbits were easygoing with their children in the matter of sitting up late, especially when there was a chance of getting them a free meal. Bringing up young hobbits took a lot of provender. There were many bagginses and boffins, and also many tooks and brandy bucks. There were various grubs, relations of Bilbo Baggins' grandmother, and various chubs, connections of his took grandfather. In a selection of burroughs, bulgers, brace girdles, rock houses, good bodies, horn blowers, and proudfoots. Some of these were only very distantly connected with Bilbo, and some of them some of them had hardly even been in Hobbiton before, as they lived in remote corners of the Shire. The Sackville Bagginses were not forgotten. Otho and his wife Lobelia were present. They disliked Bilbo and detested Frodo, but so many or but so magnificent was the invitation card, written in golden ink, that they had felt it was impossible to, to refuse. Besides, their cousin Bilbo had been specializing in food for many years, and his table had a high reputation. All the 144 guests expected a pleasant feast, though they rather dreaded the after-dinner speech of their host. An, an, an inevitable item. He was liable to drag in bits of what he called poetry, and sometimes, after a glass or two, would allude to the absurd adventures of his mysterious journey. The guests were not disappointed. They had a very pleasant feast, and in fact, an engrossing entertainment, rich, abundant, varied, and prolonged. The purchase of provisions fell almost to nothing throughout the district in the ensuing weeks. But as Bilbo's catering had depleted uh, the stocks of most stores, sellers and warehouses for miles around, that did not matter much. After the feast, more or less, came the speech. Most of the company were, however, not in a tolerant mood at that delightful stage which they called filling up the corners. They were sipping their favorite drinks and nibbling at their favorite dainties, or dainties and their fears were forgotten. They were prepared to listen to anything and to cheer at every full stop. My dear people, began Bilbo, rising in his place. Hear, 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 they shouted, and kept on repeating in it in chorus, seeming reluctant to follow their own advice. Bilbo left his place and went and stood on a chair under the illuminated tree. The lights are the light of the lanterns fell on his beaming face, the golden buttons shone on his embroidered silk waistcoats, waistcoat. They could all see him standing, waving one hand in the air. The other was his trouser pocket. My dear Bagginses and Boffins, he began again, and my dear Tooks and Brandy Bucks and Grubs and Chubs and Burroughses and Hornblowers and Bulgers and Brace Girdles, Good Bodies, Rock Houses, and Proudfoots. Proud feet, shouted an elderly hobbit from the back of the pavilion. His name, of course, was Proudfoot and well merited. His feet were large, exceptionally furry, and both were on the table. Proudfoots, re repeated Bilbo. Also, my good Sackville Bagginses, that I welcome back at last to Bag End. Today is my 111th birthday. I am 
11T1 today. Hooray, hooray, many happy returns, they shouted, and they hammered joyously on the tables. Bilbo was doing splendidly. This was the sort of stuff they liked, short and obvious. I hope you are all enjoying yourselves as much as I am. Deafening cheers, cries of yes and no. Noises of trumpets and horns, pipes and flutes, and other musical instruments. There were, as had, or has been, had, or there were, as has been said, many young hobbits present. Hundreds of musical crackers had been pulled. Most of them bore the mark Dale on them, which did not convey much to most of the hobbits, but they all agreed they were marvelous crackers. They contained instruments, small, but of perfect make and enchanting tunes, or tones. Indeed, in one corner, some of the young Tooks and Brandy Bucks, supposing Uncle Bilbo to have finished, since he had plainly said all that was necessary, now got up on an impromptu orchestra and began to and began a merry dance tune. Master Everard took and Miss Mellolot Burnybuck got on a table with bells in their hands, began to dance the Springle Ring, a pretty dance, but rather vigorous. But Bilbo had not finished. Seizing a horn from a youngster nearby, he blew three loud hoots. The noise subsided. I shall not keep you long, he cried. Cheers from all the assembly. I have called you all together for a purpose. Something in the way that he had said this made, him, made an impression. There was almost silence, and one or two of the tooks pricked up their ears. Indeed, for three purposes. First of all, to tell you that, that I am immensely fond of you all and that 11 years is too short of a time to live among such excellent and admirable hobbits. Tremendous outburst of approval. I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. This was unexpected and rather difficult. There were some scattered clapping, but most of them were trying to work it out and see if it came to a compliment. Secondly, to celebrate my birthday, cheers again, I should say our birthday, for it is, of course, also the birthday of my hair and nephew, Frodo. He comes of age and into his inheritance today. Some perfunctory clapping by the elders and some loud shouts of Frodo, Frodo, jolly old Frodo, from the juniors. The Sackville Bagginses scowled and wondered what was meant by coming into his inheritance. Together, we score 144. Your numbers were chosen to fit this remarkable total. One gross, if I may use the expression. No cheers. This was ridiculous. Many of his guests, and especially the Sackville Bagginses, were insulted, feeling sure they had only been asked to fill up the required number by goods in a package. One gross indeed, vulgar expression. It is also, if I may be allowed to refer to ancient history, the anniversary of my arrival by barrel at Esgaroth on the late Long Lake, Though the fact that it was my birthday slipped my memory on that occasion. I was only 51 then, and birthdays did not seem so important. The banquet was, the banquet was very splendid, however, though I now repeat it more correctly. Thank you very much for coming to my little party. Obstinate silence. They all feared that a song or some poetry was now imminent, and they were getting bored. Why couldn't he stop talking and let them drink his health? But Bilbo did not sing or recite. He paused for a moment. Thirdly and finally, he said, I wish to make 
an announcement. He spoke this last word so loudly and suddenly that everyone sat up who still could. I regret to announce that, though as I said, 111 years is far too short a time to spend among you. This is the end. I am going. I am leaving now. Goodbye. He stepped down and vanished. There was a blinding flash of light, and all the guests blinked. When they opened their eyes, Bilbo was nowhere to be seen. 144 flabbergasted hobbits sat back speechless. Old Odo Proudfoot removed his feet from the table and stamped. Then there was a dead silence until suddenly, after several deep breaths, every Baggins, Boffin, Took, Brandybuck, Grub, Chub, Burrows, Bulger, Brace Girdle, Brockhouse, Goodbody, Hornblower, and Proudfoot began to talk at once. It was generally agreed that the joke was in a very bad taste, and more food and drink were needed to cure the guests of shock and annoyance. He's mad, I always said so, was pop probably the most popular comment. Even the Tooks, with a few exceptions, thought Bilbo's behavior was absurd. For the moment most of them took it or for the moment most of them took it for granted that his disappearance was nothing more than a ridiculous prank. But old Rory Brandybuck was not so sure. Neither age nor an enormous dinner had clouded his wits, and he said to his daughter-in-law, Esmeralda, There's something fishy in this, dear. I believe that Mad Baggins is off again. Silly old fool. But why worry? He hasn't taken the vitals with him. He called loudly to Frodo to send the wine round again. Frodo was the only one present who had said nothing. For some time, he had sat silent beside Bilbo's empty chair <coughs> and ignored all the remarks and questions. He enjoyed the joke, of course, even though he had been in the know. He had difficulty in keeping from laughter at the indignant surprise of the guests. But at the same time, he felt deeply troubled. He realized suddenly that he loved the old hobbit dearly. Most of the guests went on eating and drinking and discussing Bilbo's, Bilbo Baggins' oddities, past and present, but the Sackville Bagginses had already departed in wrath. Frodo did not want to have any more to do with the party. He gave orders for more wine to be served, then he got up and drank his own glass silently to the health of Bilbo and slipped out of the pavilion. As for Bilbo Baggins, even while he was making his speech, he had been fingering the golden ring in his pocket, his magic ring that he had kept secret for so many years. As he stepped down, he slipped it on his finger, and he was never seen by any hobbit in Hobbiton again. He walked briskly back to his hole and stood for a moment, listening with smile to the din in the pavilion and to the sounds of merrymaking in other parts of the field. Then he went in. He took off his party clothes, folded up, and wrapped in tissue paper his embroidered silk waistcoat, waistcoat and put it away. Then he put on quickly some old untidy garments and fastened round his waist a worn leather belt, leather belt. On it he hung a short sword in a battered black leather scabbard. From a locked drawer, smelling of mothballs, he took out an old cloak and hood. They had been locked up as if they were very precious but they were so patched and weather-stained that their original color could hardly be guessed. It might, have been, it might have been dark green. They were rather too large for him. He then went into his study and from a large strong box, a large strong box took out a bundle wrapped in old cloths and a leather-bound manuscript and also a very large bulky envelope. The book and bundle he stuffed into the top of a heavy bag that was standing there. Uh, he stuffed into the top of a heavy bag that was standing there, already nearly full. Into the envelope, he slipped his golden ring and its fine chain and then sealed it and addressed it to Frodo. 
At first he put it on the mantelpiece, but suddenly he removed it and stuck it in his pocket. At that moment, the door opened, opened and Gandalf came in quickly. Hello, said Bilbo. I wonder if you would turn up. I'm glad to find you visible, replied the wizard, sitting down in a chair. I wanted to catch you and have a few final words. I suppose you feel that everything has gone off splendidly and according to plan. Yes, I do, said Bilbo. Though the flash was surprising, it quite startled me, let alone the others. A little addition of your own, I suppose. Oh, it was. You have wisely kept that ring secret all these years, and it seemed to me necessary to give your guests something else that would seem to explain your sudden vanishment. And would spoil my joke. You are an inter interfering old busybody, laughed Bilbo, but I expect you know best as usual. Oh, I do. When I know anything, but I don't feel too sure about this whole affair. It has now come to the final point. You have had your joke and alarmed or offended most of your relations, and given the whole Shire something to talk about for nine days or ninety-nine, more likely. Are you going any further? Yes, I am. I feel I need a holiday, a very long holiday, as I have told you before. Probably a permanent holiday. I don't expect I shall return. In fact, I don't mean to, and I have made all arrangements. I am old, Gandalf, and I don't like it, but I am beginning to feel in my heart of hearts, well preserved indeed. <coughs> he snorted. Why, I feel all thin, sort of stretched, if you know what I mean, like butter that has been scraped over too much bread. That can't be right. I need a change or something. Gandalf looked curiously and looked closely at him. No, I, it does not seem right, he said thoughtfully. No, after all, I believe your plan is probably the best. Well, I've made my mind up anyway. I want to see mountains again, Gandalf. Mountains. And then find somewhere where I can rest in peace and quiet, without a lot of relatives prying around and a string of confounded visitors hanging on the bell. I might find somewhere where I could finish my book. I have thought of a nice ending for it. And he lived happily ever after to the end of his days. Gandalf laughed. I hope he will, but nobody will read the book however it ends. Oh, they may, in years to come. Frodo has read it oh, some, has read some already as far as it has gone. You'll keep an eye on Frodo, won't you? Yes, I will. Two eyes, as often as I could spare him. He would come with me, of course, if I asked him. In fact, he offered to once, just before the party, but he does not really want to yet, and I want to see the wild country again before I die, and the mountains, but he is still in love with the Shire, with woods and fields and little rivers. He ought to be comforted, comfortable here. I'm leaving everything to him, of course, except a few oddments. I hope he will be happy when he gets used to being on his own. It's time he has, or he was his own master now. Everything, said Gandalf. The ring as well. You agree to that, you remember? Well, or, yes, I suppose so, stammered Bilbo. Where is it? In an envelope, if you must know, said Bilbo impatiently. There on the mantelpiece. Well, no. Here it is in my pocket. He hesitated. Isn't that odd now, he said softly to himself. Yeah, after all, why not? Why shouldn't it stay there? Gandalf looked again very hard at Bilbo, and there was a gleam in his eyes. I think, Bilbo, he said quietly. I should leave it behind. Don't you want to? Well, yes, and no. Now it comes to it. I don't like parting with it at all, I may say. And I don't really see why I should. Why do you want me to? He asked. A curious change came over his voice. It was sharp with suspicion and annoyance. 
You are always badgering me about my reign, but you have never bothered me about the other things that I got on my journey. No, I... But I had to badger you, said Gandalf. I wanted the truth. It was important. Magic rings are, well, magical, and they are rare and curious. I was professionally interested in your ring, you may say, and I still am. I should like to know where it is if you go wandering again. Also, I think you have had it quite long enough. You won't need it anymore, Bilbo, unless I am quite mistaken. Bilbo flushed, and there was an angry light in his eyes. His kindly face grew hard. Why not? he cried. And what business is it of yours anyway? To know what I do with my own things. It is mine. Yeah, I found it. It came to me. Yes, yes, said Gandalf. But there is no need to get angry. If I am, it is your. If I am, it is your fault, said Bilbo. It is mine, I tell you, my own, my precious. Yes, my precious. The wizard's face remained grave and attentive, and only a flicker in his deep eyes showered that or showed that he was startled and indeed alarmed. It has been called that before, he said, but not by you. But I say it now, and why not? Even if Gom said the same once, it's not his now, but mine, and I shall keep it, I say. Gandalf stood up. He spoke sternly. You will be a fool if you do, Bilbo, he said. You make that clear with every word you say. It has got far too much hold on you. Let it go, and then you shall go on yourself and be free. I'll do as I choose, and I go as I please, said Bilbo obstinately. Now, now, my dear hobbit, said Gandalf. All your long life you have been friends, or we have been friends, and you owe me something. Come, do as you promised. Give it up. Well, if you want my ring yourself, say so. But you won't get it. I won't give my precious away, I tell you. His hand stayed to the hilt of his small sword. Gandalf's eyes flashed. It'll be my turn to get angry soon, he said. If you say that again, I shall. Then you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. He took a step towards the hobbit, and he seemed to grow tall and menacing. His shadow filled the little room. Bill backed away to the wall, breathing hard, his hand clutching at his pocket. They stood for a while, facing one another, and the air of the room tingled. Gandalf's eyes remained bent on the hobbit. Slowly his hands relaxed, and he began to tremble. I don't know what has come over you, Gandalf, he said. You have never been like this before. What is all about? What is it all about? It is mine, isn't it? I found it, and Gollum would have killed me if I hadn't kept it. I'm not a thief, whatever he said. 